So good evening and welcome to today's live launch of the Formula of Giving Heart. This event is part of the Humanities Cultural Program, one of the founding projects for the future Stephen A. Schwarzman Center for the Humanities. I'm Darcy Springle and it is my pleasure to share um, with you this, uh, this event this evening. Um, we're all social distancing while safely live streaming this event and we hope that you're all safe and well wherever you are in the world. And before we start this evening's event, I would like to remind you that you can share comments and questions for our panel in the chat box. So first I would like to introduce our artist. Khaled Padel is an interdisciplinary artist raised in Egypt and currently residing in London. His hybrid practice includes computational media, sound, generative images and sculpture, and working with political and mythical narratives, his aesthetic research contemplates two interdependent abstractions, immorality of time and sovereignty of space, which explore the balance between intelligence, emotions, and moral judgments in both digital and physical realities. He had a recent uh, solo show at Overgaden Institute in Copenhagen. He also participated in group exhibitions at the Sharjah Art Foundation, Mosaic Rooms Gallery in London, and the Tokyo Metropolitan Art Museum. He also has an upcoming show at the Fifth International Biennial in Casablanca, Morocco, and a residency at Una Arts Helsinki, Finland. He studied computer science uh, at AAST in Egypt and sound art at the University of the Arts in London. And so we're very happy to have Khaled as a visiting fellow in the humanities this year. We originally developed our application together prior to the pandemic with the hopes of having an in-person music performance, an exhibition, a research talk, and a student workshop. Unfortunately, we had to completely rework those plans. Um, and I'm very grateful to Torch and to Khaled for having stuck with the project. Uh, Khaled especially had to completely reconceptualize uh, his work in relation to the new digital medium. And so the visiting fellowship transformed into one that was see Khaled producing an entirely new work that engaged with this current moment, which is really exciting. And so before we get into that work, I want to introduce briefly the rest of the panelists in the order of presentation. So since I will be presenting first, I'm going to introduce myself. So I'm Darcy Springle and I'm a junior research fellow in music at St. John's College here at Oxford. My work examines contemporary popular music in Egypt at the intersections of technology, capitalism, and politics. I spent the last decade doing ethnographic research on the independent music scene in Egypt, focusing especially during and after the time of the 2011 revolution. And I'm currently back in Egypt now, uh, continuing this work with a new focus on music streaming and digital technologies as they index relations of power between global North and South, and as they may perpetuate inequalities related to notions of race, class, gender, and so on among listeners and users in the Middle East. And our second panelist is Christabel Sterling. She is a musicologist specializing in ethnographic approaches to music and sound art in contemporary urban environments. She is currently a postdoctoral research fellow on the ERC funded project Sonorous Cities towards a sonic urbanism based at the music faculty at the University of Oxford. Her research explores the social relations and coalitions that music and sound produce in their life forms, focusing particularly on the potential for such coalitions to transform or reinforce existing social and spatial orders. And our third and final panelist is Christopher Haworth, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of Music at the University of Birmingham. His scholarly interests lie in the broad areas of electronic music and sound art, which he researches using a mixture of historiographic, philosophical, and ethnographic research methods. He is currently researching the short-lived cyber theory moment that accompanied the mid-1990s hype for the internet and the World Wide Web in Britain. And he was previously an AHRC Early Career Leadership Fellow on Music and the Internet towards a digital sociology of music. He also composes computer music, often incorporating principles from psychoacoustics, music psychology, and cybernetics. So how the next um, hour or so is going to work is that each of the panelists will give a short presentation. Then after all the presentations, we will give Khaled a chance to respond. 
then we will open it up and take questions from the audience. So these questions can be for the artists and about the work, or they can be in relation or as a response to um, any of the panelists. So please feel free during any of the presentations to write your questions in the chat box and know that we will get to as many of them as we can uh, at the end after all the presentations uh, have concluded. Um, so I'm going to kick things off uh, with my own presentation, which is going to connect Khaled's work to my own research in Egypt over the last decade and to notions of the political. So I want to draw attention to the way that for many in Egypt, this recent experience of isolation, of absence and disruption long preceded uh, the current pandemic. Um, I've had several friends from Egypt tell me, for instance, that the COVID-19 lockdowns reminded them of curfews implemented during the 2011 revolution. And so for the next few minutes, then I'm just going to explore some ideas around these temporal and effective juxtapositions, these overlappings with the 2011 Egyptian revolution and its aftermath. So I do so kind of to help focus our attention on the ways that global political events, such as the current pandemic, are uniquely experienced in each time and place due to the way that they animate kind of an archive of effective memory that lives in the body. So in the formula of giving heart, we see the performer Khadel wearing a gas mask that covers the eyes, nose, and mouth. We could of course read such a mask as evoking the contagion and now mandatory mask wearing of our present uh, uncertain moment, a reality reverberating around the globe. Such a mask was also a visual symbol of the 2011 Egyptian revolution when millions of protesters marched through and occupied Egyptian streets where they were met with tear gas, bullets, and tanks. So I'm just going to share my screen so you can have a bit of it an image along with this. Okay, so hopefully you can see that. Um, so here we see graffiti by the artist Zeft from that time, depicting Nefertiti wearing a gas mask, the ancient Egyptian queen standing in as a symbol of the Egyptian nation and people as they struggled for political freedom against a corrupt military regime. In this context then, the gas mask was a symbol of empowerment, specifically of the people's power. In the formula of giving heart, I couldn't help but feel these multiple temporalities and effective regimes, not only of ancient Egyptian heritage with the contemporary political reality, but also of the gas mask as a symbol both of one's inherent bodily vulnerability and of one's inherent bodily power as being part of a larger collective of the people against, for instance, a political regime. The formula of giving heart likewise draws our attention to how much we rely on a kind of recurring normativity in our temporal kind of clock, perhaps the best exemplified in the concept of pulse. So the performance is marked by the hitting of metallic sounds, as well as the visual biodata of the performer's heart rate, each which seems to suggest a sort of loose pattern or regularity. For many, the recent pandemic could likewise be described as a period of losing the pulse of everyday life. There have been marked absences in our lives, activities we cannot do, people we cannot see, and feelings of confinement within places and conditions that are beyond our control. So in the artistic world in Egypt that I'm currently researching, notions of sleeping, disappearing, absence, confinement, and silence have been major concepts of interest across a variety of artistic mediums. Um, and I've been focusing especially on the emergence of these themes within the last six years when the military returned to power. So Khadel's uh, previous work, The Essence of Disappearing, performed at the Mosaic Rooms in London in 2018, for instance, directly explores this theme of disappearance. So set in a dark lit room, the performance consisted of Padel hitting or strumming a series of metallic objects, sometimes rhythmically, but often not in, seemingly not intentionally so. The listener in such a performance is left to consider perhaps how everyday objects and materials can reverberate with sound how they can be, if not musical, then resonant. And in my research, I explore more broadly how it is that artists are conceptualizing disappearance, absence, and silence in the wake of especially traumatic events. 
So writing in the wake of the defeat of the 2011 Egyptian revolution, for instance, writer Hesem al Wardeni's How to Disappear, this is a book, uh, quote, designs a set of oral exercises that show readers how to disappear, reappear, join a group, leave a group, and other necessary skills, end quote. So in the first exercise, How to Disappear, you recommend sitting in a public place such as a park or cafe and shifting one's focus to what one hears. He instructs readers not to privilege any single sound or give these sounds any meaning, ruminating instead only on sound quality. Eventually, he writes, you will find that your inner voice gradually diminishes and at the same rate by which you immerse yourself in your sonic environment. When you ultimately succeed in listening to the sound in its entirety, you will find that the distance between yourself and the space's sounds has diminished and that you have become part of this place. You will find that no one around you notices your presence. Everyone will pass by without seeing you. So through this exercise, one and throughout the rest of the book, one is meant to learn how to shed the ego and personhood to disappear by listening, by learning to listen to objects and materials around you. So I, I see some resonances here with Hadell's formula for giving heart, which invites the listener to hear a variety of materialities, of sound qualities, including the sound of the biosensors on the performer's brain and heart, rather than recognize, rather than listening only to recognizable sonic or musical objects. So it's kind of, I would rather pose it as kind of a question here. Does the listener disappear um, as they are immersed in these different kinds of sound qualities? So I, I'm viewing or approaching the formula for giving heart then in conversation with a series of other distinct and unique works that explore themes of disappearance and absence following traumatic sociopolitical events. So these works that um, I'm in conversation with in my research include Dina al 2018 musical album, Slumber, Haytham al The Book of Sleep, and visual artist Hoda Lutfi's 2018 exhibition, When Dreams Call for Silence. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. So taken collectively, these works seem to suggest that silence and absence can be a creative practice of listening, of self-questioning, and of self-rediscovery after a period of intense trauma or rupture. Losing the pulse then, these artists might argue or might suggest, can be a means of rediscovery and rebirth. So one thing that Padel's work brings to these conversations about absence, waiting, confinement, I think, is an incisive engagement with technology's role in shaping these experiences. So um, it, technology is something that will likely shape how we rediscover ourselves, how we rediscover our pulse after this moment of collective uncertainty. So Padel described the work not as a video piece, but as a quote, lonesome performance with codes, end quote. So here the machine, which is ultimately a surveillance system, stands in the place of the absent audience. The machine is the audience. So music scholars such as Eric Dra and others have argued that the increased reliance on digital technologies for music distribution and consumption, for instance, have transformed music making into a technology of surveillance. Um, so one example being music streaming platforms now, such as Spotify, collecting our user data, not only in relation to our sonic habits, but in relation to our everyday lives. So whereas this is often framed as some, a somewhat recent phenomenon in much English language scholarship on music streaming, in many parts of the world, listening and artistic performance have long been political tools of surveillance, for instance, for state regimes. So technologies and technologies such as streaming platforms today, likewise, are increasingly encouraging artists themselves to use this data collected as surveillance as a means of transforming their artistic practice, in, in, for instance, uh, in order to better meet the needs of their listeners and their audiences. So in other words, there seems to be, and, and um, Hadell's work seems to be suggesting this kind of artistic performance for machines. And so just to kind of wrap up uh, some of my thoughts here, I wonder if Khaled might comment on the process of conceptualizing an artistic and performative work with the machine as audience in mind. So how does this 
fact, inform your artistic practice as an artist who, <clears throat> who has practiced and performed in a variety of political contexts. So does the machine here in your perspective serve as a kind of stand-in for some kind of absolute or great power? Um, and if finally, if this is indeed the direction that performance might be moving, what if anything is really new about this idea of performing for a machine from your perspective as an artist and as a performer? So I will end there and I will pass it on to Chrissy who is our next presenter. Thank, oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> hopefully I'm now unmuted. Um, thanks so much, um, Darcy. And <clears throat> thanks for inviting me to be part of the panel. It's, it's a, a real pleasure to talk with all of you. Um, <clears throat> and thanks to, to Khaled for sharing his work. Um, so I, um, I wanted to, to pick up uh, mainly on themes of, of sound and space. Um, in relation to Khaled's piece, but also uh, more broadly with respect to music and sound culture and our kind of current historical moment. <clears throat> so um, starting with something from the film, I think one thing that I found um, very striking about the piece was the way that sound is um, used to create an atmosphere of, of confinement, but also um, how sound kind of becomes almost an escape from that confinement. And for me, this was kind of achieved through this constant kind of liminal space between um, pulse and kind of arrhythmia or rhythm and, and non-rhythm, which kind of um, goes back to what to what Darcy was saying. Um, so the, in the piece, the, the sonic portrayal of the cage and the human interaction with it starts off as quite um, sonically sporadic and arrhythmic but at the same time very spatial and very corporeal the kind of reverb trails that come with physically running your hands across the bars the clatter of shaking metal and the very bodily kind of percussive performance <clears throat> and these moments really um, give a sense of how sound is inscribed with information about the surfaces and textures and spatial dimensions of a physical environment and I couldn't help but think here of um, Lawrence Abu Hamdan's investigation into Sadnaya prison in Syria, where um, in the absence of visual documentation of what went on inside, because the detainees were blindfolded, um, Abu Hamdan worked with survivors to draw out their memories of sound inside the prison. Um, so what he calls the ear witness testimonies. Um, and his, his documentation kind of, it brings home this kind of troubling notion that under conditions of, of physical incarceration and visual deprivation, sound becomes this way of orienting yourself in space. Um, so the space of confinement is defined less by its physical architecture than by its acoustic architecture and its reflective surfaces and the way that sound collides with those. Um, in your piece, Khaled, I found that the very kind of spatial sounds of um, confinement become more and more kind of viscerally confining through this quite relentless kind of clattering and um, hitting of objects until at a certain point for me they started to become something else so something more rhythmic and more patent that I could recognize and that I could almost entrain to um, and to me this kind of reflected some of the perceptual shifts that I experienced with the pandemic in the UK this kind of um, inward turn away from the complex kind of external rhythms of pre-pandemic life and towards the body and its internal rhythms um, but equally this as part of a kind of new um, state of exception to use a gambin's term which increased kind of state and peer surveillance of our bodily functions and kind of sanctioned the increased gathering of biodata um, at the same time, the way that um, the kind of clattering cage sonic space morphs into this more percussive, more rhythmic performance in the work, uh, for me, really brought to light the kind of intensely effective physiological qualities of rhythm. Um, I was reminded of Raymond Williams's notion of rhythm as um, 
quote, transmitting a description of experience, not merely as an abstraction or an emotion, but as a physical effect on the organism, on the blood, on the breathing and on the physical patterns of the brain. In the kind of threshold space that you create between something sonically quite chaotic and viscerally stifling and something more horizontal and kind of rhythmically aggregated, I was reminded um, how powerfully sound can modulate our bodily states. Going back to what you know, what Darcy was saying, its ability to move us from from one bodily state to another. Um, and I, I guess wanted to ask you a bit more about what it is for you that sound can communicate that differentiates it from maybe other media like words or images. Um, and, you know, do you feel that sound can convey something that language or even narration can never quite do justice to? Um, and related to that, how do you see the sonic and the visual elements of the piece as kind of interacting? Um, this kind of switch from the very spatial three-dimensional sonic space of the cage to the kind of flatter, more two-dimensional sound of the of the bio data and, and text-to-speech narration. Um, uh, and then the second theme that I um, just wanted to touch on has to do with the shifting spaces of sonic and visual performance throughout the, the pandemic. So uh, some of the questions that I've been kind of asking myself are, um, you know, what does it mean to participate in a musical or a sonic event through a screen? Um, and, you know, what has it meant for musical and sonic publics to lose their physical co-presence and their spatial propinquity? And what's happened to the kind of visceral forms of musical collectivity that gain their social political force through the space of appearance? Um, I've mostly been thinking about these questions in relation to um, my work on electronic dance music um, in the UK um, and other forms of live music, uh, noticing how, um, as Ben Assiter points out, the migration of musical culture online during the pandemic in many ways accelerated currents that were already underway with live stream platforms like Boiler Room, for example. So ideas about the dematerialization of collective musical experience through this kind of bedroom uh, participation, um, the intensification of the technical aspects of musical performance through the positioning of cameras over their musical equipment, and the ambivalent role that the live stream plays in widening access to musical culture on the one hand while consolidating power among big tech on the other. Uh, watching Kala's piece, I found it sort of interesting to reflect on the potential sort of differences between the digital experience of music and of audiovisual art. Um, in Ben's article that I just mentioned, he describes how um, during a live DJ stream, he spots a friend in the chat box and they perform this ironic kind of dance floor interaction. Um, and though you know, though the pandemic presented few alternatives, I think this it kind of highlights for me the absurdity of attempting to replicate the kind of sensorial, bodily, vibrational, and intensely social experience of live music through electronic space. Um, and perhaps one of the most interesting outputs from the dance music sector during the pandemic was uh, Detroit techno producer Carl Craig's sound installation that addressed the kind of loneliness and tinnitus that often follows collective musical euphoria. Uh, on the other hand, um, experiencing your uh, colors audiovisual work through a computer screen in the domestic space that I've spent most of the, the last year in uh, kind of mediated my experience in a way that both exaggerated the kind of general sense of claustrophobia and also served as a reminder of the kind of gross inequalities that the pandemic has exposed and the privilege of lockdown and of remote you know engagement and working and um i guess this opens more broadly onto issues concerning physical and virtual space uh for you know while the pandemic has doubtlessly demonstrated the kind of life-saving relief that digital connectivity can provide it's also drawn attention to the uneven distribution and access to network space, thus obviously par uh, paradoxically reinscribing geographic and concrete spatial divisions between north and south. 
And, you know, more than this, I think, as the past year has shown, electronic space can really only ever go part of the way towards challenging enforced kind of local separatisms and other spatially proximate forms of social and political zoning. Um, the urgency with which people have taken to the streets to protest in the last year indicates that it's still physical bodies in alliance, to use Judith Butler's term, upon whose existence the publicness of a political cultural terrain depends, even while mediatization plays a crucial role in this. Um, and just to bring this back to music and sound, it's sort of striking in turn to think about the kind of urban transformations or um, violations that may have taken hold in the absence of co-present, you know, often anti-racist, anti-corporate musical spaces, which were already threatened by financial urban space before the pandemic. Um, so as a, as a kind of final question, I wondered, Khaled, what your thoughts, you know, had been about the reception and the audiences of the work and the kinds of spaces that it might be experienced in and how that did or sort of didn't affect your, your aesthetic choices and, and how that might affect the work um, as a whole. Um, so just a few thoughts from me. Um, I think I am now handing over to um, Christopher. Um. Hello. Um, well, yeah, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Hallad, for um, sharing your work. Um, Darcy um, has already introduced me, um, and I won't say any more um, other than just to bit, give a bit of context to what I'll say in the, um, I'm currently working on a kind of edited collection on music and cybernetics. Um, and since this is kind of in my brain um, at the moment a bit, it will inform my response to Harled's work. Um, so I hope some of it is in, in some way useful. Um, so I'll, I'll start just to say a bit about cybernetics um, and then talk about how cybernetics gets into music. Um, and from there, I'll, I'll, I'll come on to Hallad's work um, and pose some questions in relation to it. So um, cybernetics um, is often seen as quite an off-putting discipline um, associated as it tends to be with a kind of grim, grey, Cold War military industrial um, uh, atmosphere. Um, and in many ways, this perception is true, I would say. Um, going back to its formation, it did form at the beginning of the Cold War um, and has its roots in military research um, in the US. Um, uh, at base, what we can say about cybernetics is that it's a science of control and communication systems um, that aspired to kind of generality, um, so that systems could include organic systems, biological systems, mechanical systems, computational systems, social systems, um, the ecosystem, um, and more. Um, in terms of understanding cybernetics um, and what it attempted to do, um, it's helpful to look at the or origins of the term in the Greek word um, kiveranites, um, which translates as steersman or orchestrator. Um, and um, these terms are, are more useful, I think, for um, English speakers in terms of understanding um, the issues of agency, control and complexity that cyberneticians were interested in. Um, if you think of um, piloting a plane, steering a plane, um, conducting an orchestra um, and the kind of control that one um, has in these situations, it's a much more complex matter um, than if you're simply in the orchestra playing a triangle. Um, it's an emergent effect of lots of individual processes that all have a certain autonomy and could all break off on their own if they wanted to. Um, and while a human operator sits at the center of them, um, it doesn't necessarily have to. Um, you know, you, you can have a completely autopoetic cybernetic system um, that um, operates independently of human control. Um, and so this, um, th this notion of a kind of, um, 
more uh, emergent form of control. Um, you know, if you think of it in relation to electronic music where cybernetic ideas have been very popular, um, it describes the kind of control that you might have over a modular synthesizer um, rather better, I think, than, um, you, you know, you might understand the control you, you would have over a guitar or a piano. Um, that sense of sort of steering something, steering sound, um, which has its own autonomous momentum and can continue without the operator, um, describes um, the kinds of systems that cyberneticians were often interested in analysing. Um, now, cybernetics was unusually interdisciplinary, um, but musical and cultural systems weren't the initial sorts of things that um, cyberneticians were interested in. So Norbert Weiner, the founder of cybernetics, um, had done war-related research um, for the United States uh, going back to before they entered the war. And one of the systems that Viner pioneered um, early on was an anti-aircraft fire control system, which was a gun um, with a human operator that could anticipate the position of an enemy bomber, taking into account the time the missile would take to reach the um, enemy bomber, environmental factors and so on. Um, so it's just important to sort of situate cybernetics inside of that context that it emerged from, I think. Um, and um, within that early research, um, it was often the case that these systems that were components of humans and machines were, in terms of the way they were modeled, they were assimilated to one kind of mechanism to understand it. So um, uh, in the case of this um, anti-aircraft bomber, it's a kind of servo mechanism, the kinds of things, regulatory mechanisms that you get in things like thermostats that were used to, um, that were the, the sort of frame of reference for understanding this this whole kind of assemblage of human and um, technological components, um, representing human psychology and human kind of desires once was deemed too difficult really within this um, scenario. Um, so cybernetics starts to make its way into the experimental arts in the 1950s, and then by the 1960s, it's fairly pervasive. Um, a canonical example of cybernetics in experimental music is the work um, Music for Solo Performer by Alvin Lussier. Um, and in this work, we see a similar assimilation of the human to the mechanical. Um, in the piece, Alvin Lussier's alpha brain waves are analyzed using an EEG sensor. Um, and this low frequency um, that's between sort of eight and 12 hertz is amplified using a, um, a dial system that's to, uh, that is to hand as Alvin Lussier sits down with this um, system on him. Um, and then that's sent to a loudspeaker where it produces a low frequency, reproduces a low frequency that causes the kind of cone in the loudspeaker to vibrate back and forwards slowly. Um, and this loudspeaker is placed face up and there are percussion instruments on, on them, sort of handheld percussion instruments. Um, so the whole thing is a quite complex chain that Lucier is at, at sort of, to use Douglas Kahn's terms, in circuit with. Um, providing the, um, the, the sort of input frequency, if you like, but also the kind of regulation. Um, and if he um, is sort of uh, distracted by the sound of the percussion instruments in the room, then, you know, if he opens his eyes, uh, the frequency, uh, you know, increases um, and he loses the alpha wave state and the, the effect is lost. So it's this careful sort of negotiation um, uh, of the uh, of the environment. Um, but the brain is very much not a sort of representational thinking device. It's a it's a frequency generator that's acting as a sort of um, yeah servo mechanical control system on the piece. Um, it, and, and, and I think there are similarities really with the way that the brain uh, and the human performer is conceptualized um, between um, the human in the uh, Lucier's piece and um, the human in the anti-aircraft um, uh, gun system of Viner's. Um, 
in Khaled's piece, um, the, the heart joins the brain, um, if you like, as a source of data, at least from what I can understand. Um, so biosensors on the heart provide the pulse for the percussive sections of the piece. Um, and they also create interesting sort of aestheticized um, signal representations that we see. So you can um, uh, see these uh, signal representations that are probably, we're not, it's not clear to the audience um, what they represent, but they're bio um, signals, um, uh, presumably heart or brain data. Um, and so it, there are similarities, I would say, with Lucier's um, work. Um, firstly, in the sense that there's a kind of um, scientific aesthetic. Um, so in Lucier's piece, it's this sight of a kind of, you know, performer with this medical device on their skull staying absolutely still it's somewhere between a sort of scientific experiment and a seance um and then in Hallad's work there's the sort of data aesthetic um uh calling to mind um you know um, medical representations um uh, of bio data um and then another similarity i would say is the presence of sort of percussion um where um, I, I'd be interested to hear what Hallard says about this, but um, it might be seen as a sort of um, symbol of human scale sound and agency against the sort of potentially autonomous instruments of industrial science, um, which are the sort of uh, bio um, capture devices. Um, uh, th there are also interesting differences, I think, between Formula of Giving Heart and Music for Solo Performer, and, and one that really stood out to me, um, and again, that I would like to hear more about um, from Halled, is um, the presence of the serpent and the forms of the spells uh, and the role that they play, because in the way that cybernetics has been sort of um, taken up um, uh, within electronic music, it tends to be um, in feedback concepts of feedback or feedback systems um notions of distributed agency um distributed cognition as well uh, are, are all ways in which cybernetics sort of um takes shape within electronic music um and symbolism like this is not um typical i would say um but it was something that norbert viner was interested in um and references to demons and sorcery do appear very frequently in his writings um so i have a quote here from the human use of human beings um where he says among the gentlemen who have made it their business to be our mentors and who administer the new program of science Many are nothing more than apprentice sorcerers, fascinated with the incantation, uh, sorry, incantation, which starts a devilment that they are unable to stop. Now, Viner's fear of um, a kind of demoniac cybernetics reflects the position of scientific pacifism that he arrived at later in his career, um, where he rejected his early work uh, for the US defense um, department and increasingly comes to present cybernetics as a struggle if you like to hold on to a, a normative conception of the human against a world of entropy chaos and potential automization um so um what i'm kind of trying to elaborate really at least within cybernetics and obviously it's a huge area that i can only i can't do full justice to but is that as well as there being shifting systems in play um, ecosystems, technical systems, organic systems. There's also a, a shifting concept of the human um, from one that regulates the machine and is conceptualized as on a par with it, with the anti-aircraft um, uh, uh, gun, gun um, sort of system um, to one that needs to be preserved from its alienating kind of demonic effects, the, the demonic effects of sort of techno science. Um, and I suppose what I'd like to know um, is whether any of this resonates with Harled, but um, also does anything change when we sort of um, transplant this from Western science to um, uh, Egypt and North Africa, um, you know, with the presence of the symbol of the serpent, um, do we need to um, think more about the concept of the human that cybernetics um, tries to universalize. So 
yeah, I'll leave it at that. So thank you, Christopher and Chrissy, for these really, really fascinating discussions. Um, now going to turn it over to Khalid to give him a chance to respond to any of the uh, many questions that were sent his way. Um, so I've, I've written some notes on some of the questions, but it looks like you were too, Khalid. So happy to, to, to send any reminders or feel free to just um, jump in on what, whichever questions you, you feel like answering first. Um. Yeah, th th thanks to everyone. Uh, it's uh, very uh, insightful responses and, and also like it gives me a different perception of, of, of my own experimentation in a way. Uh, and uh, yeah, I would love, to, let's go into it directly. <laughs> um, I'm interested in many points uh, and uh, I will start like, with the same sequence, so I'll start with you, Darcy, and, and we go to Christopher. So uh, I think like uh, uh, with what you say, Darcy, like mainly uh, what interests me, and I think you, you close it with the question that uh, about like the exactly like of what we are experiencing with the machine, and like how the experience of the production between an artist and a machine uh, in terms of performance art and what is the political uh, notion between uh, between as an artist and a machine within these circumstances of the pandemic and how it relates with similar uh, uh, similar variation of political uh, rupture in a way that happened in the Egyptian revolution and, and what are the similarities and differentiation in terms of of absence and 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 uh, disappearance, the notions of disappearance. Um, does the listener disappear uh, th through the piece itself? I'm not suggest suggesting anything. Um, I'm questioning uh, through the practice itself. Uh, but like in within the the listening and the, the the practice of listening itself. And the notion of disappearance that's very interesting yeah and 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 i see it maybe because it's very fresh i just like uh bumped it bumped and and it came across yesterday uh on on in in, in sufism for example and you have in sufism the concept of uh of uh, the, the veil yeah which is like at a certain point of transcendence when the veil is released and you can see the beauty of creation yeah which is certain level of transcendence uh it comes from listening before before the visual yeah? uh, and it kind of grabbed me in a way because this is how i feel i feel and this is all could 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 cross with uh answering also or responding to uh, uh christabel in terms of like the audio visual and sound and in terms of production or, or or as an artistic practice i always like feel that listening state is brings me the visual like the, the listening state is the main introduction to 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 have a vision in a way um, it takes to a certain uh, spiritual state um, that it is immersive and collective and this is where i struggled in in, in, the, in the in the piece is the collective listening state uh, as a performer, uh, that's the main thing more than the musical composition. It is the collective listening activity that it is ritualistic even before the 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 the, uh, the, the, the linguistic communication uh, is the ritualistic sonic uh, practice that uh, it's embedded in our human culture um, and. And this is very interesting with the with the whole industry of 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 music and 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 which I don't relate to, by the way. Uh, although, like, I come from music uh, as a musician. Yes, that's my background, but I don't relate to the music industry. And uh, for so, for example, like reflecting on um, the encaps encapsulation of time and space in in the music in the 
in the pandemic and everything became on YouTube, everything became on Spotify, everything become like this is uh, a formation of the uh, um, it, it shapes the production process even even after when there will be physical, it, it will be shaped. We, we found in history many examples in that, like how technology could shape, you can find it. Like Bebop in a way, it was invented invented, invented or, or formed by this, uh, by political conflicts from the uh, economical crisis from the world, uh, Second World War. You have the Bebop shaped, you have the, uh, for example, the musical composition was, uh, squashed into a uh, 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 linear temporal experience in a way like it's very linear from start to end this is by the invention of documenting and recording the music in a way uh, so saving and documenting music kind of this technology also uh, limited and and shaped the production i don't want to say limited like shaped the production of music uh, and how the musician works uh, the invention of piano it totally changed the whole world uh, in terms of uh, the the varieties of scales and frequencies that the humans used to play all around the world and the invention of piano with the colonial structure and colonial uh, uh, exportation uh, it also eliminated many uh, many uh, sonic cultures uh, so technology always like shape in the in the form of production, and we are witnessing this today. Uh, we still don't understand where it will go or how it will be shaped in terms of a musical production. We can see it as an experience, as a listening experience, as an audience, as as a consumer. Let's say, uh, um, and I say consumer in terms uh, of of of, of uh, uh, the services of these applications. Uh, but in production, I'm sure it will give totally new culture of music um, um, after the pandemic. Or who, who, whatever, how how many years it will take? It could be a generation or two. Uh, but in a collective listening experience, for me, this is something totally different than the music industry and the way of production. Uh, and and for me, like listening experience is is is, is spiritual, um, and the spirituality uh, of this experience it's collective as a ritual, and music used to be part of very important part of that, and it kind of uh, uh, had a big distance and gap um, through throughout history and through the entertainment industry that <laughs> dominated the music culture. Uh, it separated the collective listening experience from from music. Uh, so, in in the piece itself, to 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 grab the listening collective experience, I did have a big struggle with it. And uh, this is my first uh, engagement since the pandemic started. I had a very clear decision that I do not want to engage in the world of cyber in terms of art uh, because I see the medium. The main medium that I work with is uh, is space, uh, and in terms of installation, is mainly the space and time and uh, performance. Made also like space and time. So uh, these are the two main mediums that yeah I can I can work with objects, but the objects are the it resonates the space, and this is how I listen with everyone. I'm not performing to people. I'm performing with people. Uh, so transforming that into a, a screen experience, um, me personally, I'm not convinced with it. Uh, and that's for me, the formula of giving heart is not a complete piece. It's, a, it's a, for me, it's an archival material. It's like sketches. And that's a very beautiful point from you when you started to compare between sound, sound and audiovisual. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I do understand the experience on 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 laptop on the same desk where I work every day. It's uh, it's very different than I go to a certain space that has its own metaphysical culture that I'm working with, and and. And everyone is working, like the listener, every listener is working with 
uh, not only the uh, the the musician or 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 the performer it's everyone attending is part of the piece and this is the listening experience that would make i would i would uh, rely on 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 yeah the fresh ideas that uh, came from yesterday is the, the 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 notions of of absence and 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 being hidden and in sufism in into to 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 remove the hijab uh, it comes from uh, the listening experience and and this is the notion of hidden hidden and absence and death is not is not uh, comes politically uh, this is a response like when we compare for example between the revolution sorry i'm i'm crossing many uh, ideas but responding to darcy like from from the revolution and to till today for me personal experience uh politically i i refer to the medium itself yeah uh, political art in my experience is 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 the the relation between me and the medium more than uh, the the political the political environment where i'm in uh, definitely the polit- political environment uh, shapes my relation with the medium for example here i'm locked in a space i'm working with a locked space uh shapes the technologies with with what i'm working with um but i refer like the notions of absence in terms of the experience between me and the medium this is like mainly uh with with what i'm working more for example than the memory, uh, memories of the uh, syrian prisoners of uh, abu hamdan uh in that piece uh he worked on their memory in being locked um and being absent from society i i refer more the absence of my own experience is being hidden in the transcendence by through listening yeah and and my awareness to the, to, to 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 that or how i tripped in that in a way yeah it was the, pol- the political situation at the time of the revolution yes one seeing death and and and, and working uh, uh, experiencing death with uh, people around you uh, you have friends who died you had friends who kidnapped you had friends like in this environment and you in a daily you start to 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 feel the uh, absence of of uh, not only people yeah uh, it could be also being you as locked and this is like very a similar situation of the uh, the pandemic uh, you start to contemplate a lot about being absent and uh, and you contemplate a lot about the state of death um, and when at certain point i realized that it is a state of transitioning yeah it's not a state of absence it's transition from one state to another and this is what i liked in the sufism that it takes you from one state to another in sort of uh, having a spiritual transcendence um and here i would see absence and notions of absence totally different than at the time of the revolution that it is uh, 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 an author- authoritarian and and that it imposed on you and and take you to to be absent yeah <laughs> um now i see it in a very totally different way that was the inspiration at that time um and the translation like from one state to another i would go into uh christopher in terms of the cybernetics and 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 uh and i really love like how you ended it to 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 uh, uh, to talk more about the serpent uh, because I think the serpent is the main thing that made me interested in 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 framing the work in terms of yes I want to understand response from uh, uh, perception of cybernetics and I tell you why uh, because um, mm-hmm. yes sure uh, if um, yeah is uh, linguistic and communication this is uh what really interested me um because we can find like uh on on, on general like main main uh, um, language culture and communication culture from the pictorial times and that 
totally transformed into the alphabetic era. And um, now, or like during, like, it's, it's transformed to the computational and, uh, and the coding and programming and the computational language, the machinery language. Uh, and I like how, how seeing the languages are being translated, or sorry, not the languages, the communication uh, is being translated in terms of system and authority and sovereignty. Uh, and in that point, uh, tra transforming the mythical or, or the myth and the concepts uh, and principles from ancient Egypt that talks about the pulse and the dimensions of being uh, to translate it into uh, programming and, and to try to code it and to try even in the medical sense, not in the functional at all, not in the functional application of cybernetics, but more on the contemplating on, on, on how getting the hieroglyphics that it is pictorial, that it is translated by archaeologists into linguistic uh, alphabetic and I'm learning about it and I'm retranslating it into uh, composing this character again, which is uh, um, a sort of authority and a sort of sovereignty that it is a god uh, that that's teaching uh, uh, a listener, <laughs> and this comes from a mythical drama that it uh, it uh, from ancient Egypt, and I I liked to 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 work with this in terms of translating the the same mythical but not to the audience. I'm not storyteller to the audience, but more into me, myself, and the, uh, 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 working with the, with the files, uh, like coding the files. So how the eyes would be, how the tongue would be, how the intelligence would be, and how to decompose the serpent, that it is an authority and sovereignty in a sense of uh, teaching uh, in the story. Uh, and how to take this into forming a character uh, through coding files. And here I got interested in sense of cybernetics more than the applications and the functionality of it, but my uh, relationship with the medium. So yeah, I went like and linking everything uh, together. I hope I responded. But there are questions. yeah no, that's great yeah there so we have um we have one question i think you began already to answer it so it's about the serpent but maybe this will just invite you to um expand on that more uh, mm -hmm. so the question is um thank you so much for your piece how did the character of the serpent guide the work i'm interested in the role of the text uh, slash symbolism in such a visually modern work yes um i i i tried to Okay, I, I tried as much as I can to prevent the ancient Egyptian aesthetic. I always try to prevent the ancient Egyptian aesthetic. I try to go beyond the visual aspect of it because it has very strong uh, uh, visual. Uh, and if there are audiences are into the, the ancient Egyptian mythologies and, uh, and history, it's... Uh, uh, it's very, uh, the visual of it and the sculpture and the pictorial representation is very, very dominant and, and beautiful, I learned. Like I'm not diminishing at all, but sometimes I feel it, 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 shadow, it shadow the principles or it shadow the, the, the concepts and the meanings uh, uh, um, because easily we can gaze on the aesthetic itself. Uh, so in that sense, I started to uh, make a collage between uh, um, the, the formula of giving art is like collection of scripts that it, 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 uh, it's were used to uh, in the process of mummification. Yeah. So it is a praising of the heart uh, to, to praise the heart before it goes to the underworld to be judged. Because in ancient Egypt, you have the heart. Uh, and when it reached to the judge day, it used to get balanced by a feather. And feather is might, which is the goddess of uh, harmony. Yeah. So it's a principle of the harmony being balanced with the heart. And heart is a very uh, core of, uh, of, um, of existence at that time. Yeah? So the heart is, the intelligence is the heart. Yeah? It comes from the heart, not the brain. Uh, in, 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 in Kemet or the ancient Egyptian. 
uh, sorry, even though said, like the heart is the seat or the throne of intelligence, emotions, and moral judgment. And this is, uh, uh, it has two dimensions. One dimension is the uh, uh, physical, the, 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 the organic and the physical aspect of heart. And one is the moral and the, uh, and these two dimensions uh, uh, in, made me to be inspired of like the duality of what it does mean to have a pulse, yeah. Uh, because in, for example, like musically, you can have um, uh, there is a there is a pulse in silence, no. Um, in in a musically high, you can have like the rhythm, uh, uh, one rhythm, one beat, and the pulse could be hidden. If you can have offbeat, and you still have pulse uh, in it. And kind of this duality, uh, it was interesting to contemplate on it, especially when the pulse of every day uh, got totally locked down suddenly. So it, we totally change our pulses and it confused, definitely it, it's a big part of confusion is the rhythm of every day, it got uh, uh, shifted. And so this duality is kind of uh, attracted me to, to work on this material and to try to uh, select uh, and the Sri Mansur uh, helped me uh, in, in, in retranslating into uh, 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 I don't want to say futuristic sense but like we changed uh, um, the names of gods into principles or that the gods would represent so we reworked it we did edit it uh, to, 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 to get into the uh, contemporary sense but definitely it is an amazing inspiration. And uh, so I tried to prevent the, the literal uh, uh, script itself and uh, the pictorial aesthetic of ancient Egypt and try to, to get the inspiration for, from its uh, philosophy uh, because it is uh, a philosophy at the end. It's not... Uh, um, yeah, it is a, yeah, you got what I mean. So to pick the meaning of the philosophies and try to rework it in, 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 in a piece, in a personal uh, sketches. Yeah, thanks, Charlotte. That's really interesting. Uh, we have we have a couple more questions and I might just say them all at once because I think we're over time. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, so if we could just um, maybe conclude briefly and then we'll take these questions and then we'll be out. So the, the next question is, there is an Orwellian quality of the work in the surveillance, et cetera. Was that purposeful or just as a result of creating the work in the time of COVID? Um, we have another question that asks, can you please uh, elaborate on the idea of the mask? Is it somehow um, fictionalized in your character? Um, or do you use it in most of your performances? How uh, does it connect to the revolution? And, um, and then a, another question asking to bring it, uh, to connect it more to the revolution. Uh, so, sorry, the, the, the first question, okay, I got the second. The first question was, there is an Orwellian quality of the work in the surveillance and so on. Was that purposeful or just as a result of creating the work in the Orwellian? What does it mean, Orwellian? Uh, like George Orwell. Um, oh, oh, or, yeah, yeah. Uh, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. George Orwell is uh, uh, definitely there is a, there there is a, res, a political response ah and and that could be also like a response to uh, Christopher and when you said like the aesthetic and the political right? because definitely there is a political uh, surely there is a very strong political influence with all of this crazy year uh, I don't have a direct response to the political movements uh, or demonstrations that were happening. I don't have any uh, political positioning, let's say, uh, in, in, in that sense, but there is a political aesthetic, surely, and there is a political feel uh, as, 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 uh, as the noise or as uh, the, the dis distorted rhythmic. Uh, that's, for me, is a political respond 
beside, but but I don't have a political position to a movement. Uh, and maybe uh, the notions of surveillance, uh, yes, and this is a, a, a substitute of, of a negative substitute of audience because mm-hmm. like the notion of collective listening is not there and and without an audience, there is no art, um, which I don't understand what we are doing, to be honest, these days. But like, if there is no audience, there is no art. It's, it's, it is the art itself. So I don't understand. Uh, yeah, so in part of the experimentation, because of these circumstances, I try to substitute with uh, uh, being surveyed by uh, the character of serpent. So it's kind of conversation between me and 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 the serpent, uh, in production and in the work. Uh, it's not in the work only. It's also in the production because the serpent is the one that it is filming, because there are like five cameras in one server. So the cameraman is the serpent, uh, in that sense. So it's a. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, it's not it's not only fictional um, in that in that sense um the gas mask uh, the gas mask i have several pieces i use the gas mask and it kind of uh, 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 not all of them uh, so it's not like i create a fictional uh, artistic character uh, so there are pieces that I use the gas mask, I don't know why. Uh, it puts me into a, a certain nostalgic state. Um, uh, surely that I there is the breathing sound in it. So when I breathe in it, in the mask, there is the sound of it. And most of the pieces, I use the sound in the performance, but not this piece. I don't use the sound of breathing because I didn't want to over layer with the heart and the, the concept of heart. Uh, but the state of listening to my own breath, uh, um, it puts me into a certain uh, state where I can be um, more free in a way, uh, and confident in a way. And, and it comes from the revolution, uh, I think so. Uh, so it's not, it's not a created character. It's, it's, it's a variation of me, uh, of my memory uh, in that sense. Okay, thanks for, for responding to those questions. And thank you uh, to the audience for your questions. Um, since we're, we're over time now, I think we will stop there. And I just first want to thank Khaled for producing this work under extremely difficult and uncertain conditions um, and for sharing it with us. I want to thank my co-panelists, Chrissy Sterling and Christopher Howard uh, for their fantastic insights. I also want to thank Liz Green and Christina Lugoshi at Torch for their tremendous help throughout this entire process and to the Torch Humanities Cultural Program for funding and supporting this work. You can catch Khaled's next online event on June 9th at 2.30 p.m. So this event is going to be a workshop in which Khaled will explore the development of the formula for give, of giving heart, as well as the transformations of the artistic process due to the COVID-19 pandemic and its implications on the future of performance and installation art. So we hope to see many of you there and hope that you take care and stay healthy in the meantime. So thank you, goodbye.